Uh, now I'd like to introduce the chair of uh, Vision Quest 2013 in Toronto and our first speaker of the day, uh, Dr. Carol Schwartz, who's going to provide an introduction of AMD. Uh, Dr. Uh, Schwartz graduated with honors from the Faculty of Medicine at uh, U of T, and after interning at Wellesley, she graduated from the Ophthalmology Residency Program at the University of Toronto and took additional uh, training at the University of Western Ontario. She's been on the staff at Sunnybrook and Women's College Hospital, Women's College Health Sciences Centre since 1986, with a special interest in the, in the treatment of diabetic retinopathy and age-related uh, macular degeneration. She's also an assistant prof of ophthalmology in the Faculty of Medicine at U of T. And I think uh, what uh, sets her apart is, um, uh, as you know, uh, we see a lot of people who speak, but I rarely see a communicator who is so has such clarity and passion as Dr. Schwartz. She's also the proud mom of two big guys. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Carol Schwartz. <laughs> Just tell people to hold their questions, don't you? Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Sharon, for that lovely introduction. And thank you to the Foundation Fighting Blindness to give me this opportunity to try and learn something together. And thank you to all of you for coming. Um, there's a lot of information to communicate over a relatively short period of time. I see lots of familiar faces, my patients in the audience, so thank you for your support. You know that I tend to, I tend to go on and on and on. So to try to keep me on task, I decided that with all due respect to David Letterman, I would try to organize my lecture to you today as the top 10 things you need to know about age-related macular degeneration. So I have two 15 to 20 minute sessions, and I'm gonna try to split it five and five. Um, I'll let you know at the end when I'm finished my first five, and we will have time for a few questions, and then we will move on. So please hold your questions till the end, okay? So I don't have any drum roll or fanfare, but Number 10 of what you need to know for, for, for age-related macular degeneration. AMD is the most common cause of legal blindness in people over the age of 50. And unfortunately, the, the United States is much better at keeping statistics than we are. And I'm going to quote you some American statistics just to give you a sense of the scope of what we are talking about and what's coming down the line. We all know that the percentage of patients with macular degeneration increases dramatically as people get older. So 7.1% of people between the ages of 60 to 69 have significant visual loss due to age-related macular degeneration. 15% of people between the age of 70 to 79, and this statistic to me was staggering, 35% of people over the age of 80 have significant visual ability due to age-related macular degeneration. 13 million Americans have evidence, some evidence, of age-related macular degeneration. And just because of our population differences, if you, if you try to convert American statistics to Canadian statistics, the classic example is to divide everything by 10. So that is a staggering number of patients in the developed world. As you know, our population is rapidly aging, and as... Um, the first baby boomers, as we push forward and reach that magic age of 65, it is an enormous burden in terms of the number of people who will be at risk of vision loss from macular degeneration. It's estimated by the year 2020, seven and a half million people over the age of 65 in the US will have age-related visual loss. So this is a huge health, social and economic burden. There have been many studies that have done that patients fear a diagnosis of blindness 
only second to a diagnosis of cancer. And I'm sure many of you in the audience have gone through all of those stages in terms of adjusting to your diagnosis. The other thing that's often not talked about when you talk about the burden of vision loss from macular degeneration is the associated diseases. People fall. You can't drive anymore, so you lose your independence. And I think one of the least talked about aspects of vision-related loss from macular degeneration is the anxiety and the depression that that engenders. And I think that's a whole topic on its own, but I'm sure many of you in the audience can relate to that. And I think that's something very important to recognize both for patients, for caregivers, and us as physicians. Number nine of the most important things you need to know about age-related macular degeneration. And I'm not going to discuss this much because Dr. Bakshi has arrived and she's going to talk about risk factors. But there are risk factors that you cannot control. Age-related macular degeneration is most common in Caucasian women, blonde and blue eyes. And this is not only because, as women, we tend to outlive our male counterparts. If you sit in my waiting room on my Thursdays or Fridays, which are my big treatment days, and you look up and down the hall, and you're a male, you may feel like you're the only one sitting out there. But there are genetic and other demographic factors why it's more common in women. The other risk factor that you can't control is that 50% of cases run in families. Number eight, there is one risk factor that you can control, smoking. As if you needed another reason to stop smoking, like heart disease, emphysema, and lung cancer isn't enough, smoking will make you go blind, as if you need another reason. Number seven, what you need to know for macular degeneration. There are two kinds. And just to make sure that we're all on the center of the same page, just to give you a little bit of anatomy and physiology as to how the eye works. The eye is like a camera. And if you think of the film in a camera, and we all make jokes that if you, depending on the age of the group that I'm talking to, most young people don't know what Kodak or Polaroid film is. They're thinking sensors in a digital camera. But I'm hoping all of you know what Kodak or Polaroid film is. So if you think of the eye like a camera, the retina is like the film layer in a camera. And I'm asked all the time, well, can't you just change my glasses? Why can't you change my glasses and let me see better? And if you think the analogy of the eye like a camera, if you have damaged spot in your film, it doesn't matter whether you use a zoom lens or a telephoto or a fisheye lens. If you have damaged film or film that's out of date or overexposed, you're not going to see well. And that's why, in many cases, changing your glasses does not make your vision better or instantly fix macular degeneration. The macula is the dead center part of your vision. So it's responsible for all your detailed vision, your colored vision. When you look right at something, you are using your macula. Dry macular degeneration is the most common cause of age-related macular degeneration. And it accounts for 90% of all cases. And the hallmark feature of dry macular degeneration is the accumulation of tiny, teeny, some of you may have seen pictures of your eyes at your optometrists or at your ophthalmologist, at your retina specialist. And the hallmark of dry macular degeneration is teeny, teeny little yellow dots or splotches that are called drusen. And they are made up of a fatty, proteinaceous material. And there are two factors that determine drusen formation. One is that over a lifetime, 
It may be the accumulation of garbage or end products from the receptors in the eye called the rods and cones. And these cells have a very, very high rate of metabo metabolism. So they are constantly turning out, turning over, and renewing themselves, but there's a lot of junk that's left over. So these little drusen accumulating are the result of an overproduction of these end products, but there may also be poor circulation and other factors that prevent the blood supply from clearing these out. Wet macular degeneration is the least common cause. It accounts for only 10% of all cases. So 90% are dry, 10% are wet. And we still do not have, we have ideas and there's all kinds of research why in wet macular degeneration you start to get abnormal blood vessels growing up underneath the retina where they should not be growing. And somebody must have, nobody spoke to me, but the analogy they used in the video, and my patients, you've all heard this, I liken it to abnormal blood vessels growing through a crack in your sidewalk or a crack in your driveway. And we think that there are genetic factors and possibly some inflammatory factors which determine why these abnormal blood vessels grow. You may have no clue that they're there, and once they start, you can lose your vision overnight so that you can go to bed and everything is fine, and you can wake up the next morning with a big blind spot in your vision or things such as door frames or vertical blinds, which used to be straight, can be distorted because these abnormal blood vessels that grow are not normal. They have very, very weak walls and without any provocation at all can bleed. And that's when we see the sudden devastating loss of vision. The incentive or the impetus for these blood vessels to grow, and I want you to remember this term because what I'm gonna talk about in my next session on treatments, there is a hormone or a growth factor that is elaborated by the retina. And whether it's driven by inflammation or whether it's driven by ischemia, which means poor blood supply, the inflammation and the poor blood supply causes the production of a growth factor called vascular endothelial growth factor, or I'm gonna shorten that to VEGF. And when this factor was discovered about 20, 25 years ago to be the driving force of abnormal blood vessels in retinal disease, be it macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy, that gave researchers the opportunity to try and block that. So these abnormal blood vessels are driven by VEGF. And I want you to remember that for my next session when I start to talk about treatments. Number six, although there is still no good treatments available for dry macular degeneration, personally, I would much rather have the dry form than the wet form. As I mentioned to you, dry macular degeneration accounts for 90% of cases of macular degeneration, but only 10% of legal blindness is due to dry macular degeneration. It's the opposite. Wet macular degeneration, although you'd never know it in my office, wet macular degeneration is much less common. It accounts for only 10% of cases, but if you, it, it accounts for 90% of the vision loss. So wet macular degeneration is still what we are trying to treat. Okay, so we're up to number six, halfway. Uh, do we have time for questions? Okay, uh, any questions from what I've talked about so far? At the back, and please a microphone so everybody can hear. So you were saying that the VEGF uh, hormone? Well, it's not really a hormone, it's a growth factor. So does it produce the, the blood vessels or are the blood vessels, do the blood vessels cause the production of that? Well, it's, it is a bit of a cycle, it's a good point, but it's that underlying inflammation 
and possibly poor blood supply that what we call upregulates or causes the, causes the production of VEGF. And then VEGF drives the growth of the new blood vessels. There are many, let me give you an example, there are many areas in the body where you need VEGF. For example, if you break your bone and your bone has to meld together and heal, you naturally need VEGF to grow those new blood vessels so that your bone knits together. If you have a heart attack and you have areas of ischemia or poor blood vessel in your heart circulation, VEGF is needed and is produced naturally and for good reasons to resupply and try to what we call revascularize your heart muscle. And I'll mention it now because we're going to get into it. That's why our new treatments, we actually inject the medication right into the eyeball to get it where we wanted to. If these VEGF blockers were given intravenously throughout your whole body, you actually can cause very serious health problems. So just like anything in the body, VEGF is a balance. There is situations where VEGF you need, and in fact, you might die if you don't have VEGF. But then there are other examples, specifically in the eye, where VEGF is the driver of very significant disease. Great question. Yes? Sunlight influence on the proliferation of blood vessels. It, and in particular, ultraviolet radiation. Not so much on the, and I'm going to leave some of it, because I think, Nupra, you're going to mention some of the ultraviolet. So our, one of our other speakers will address it directly. Not so much on the production of the abnormal blood vessels, but perhaps the ultraviolet, um, what we call oxid, increases oxidative stress in the eye and cr contributes to some of that garbage waste product accumulation that I was talking about. So I didn't specifically go into some of those other risk factors because Dr. Bakshi, one of our other speakers, is going to address that. So just to reiterate, we're doing the Carol Schwartz top 10, what you need to know for age-related macular degeneration with all due respect to Dr. Letterman, <laughs> David Letterman. <laughs> okay, we are down to number five. Treatments have evolved over time. And when I started in practice 25, almost 30 years ago, we had treatments for fewer than 5% of patients with wet age-related macular degeneration. And whether we had treatment or not at that time, we had laser photocoagulation, which in the video, they, they gave the example of the jackhammer. I like to use another analogy. I like to say that it's like welding. You're going to heat, use the, the heat energy of the laser to seal off those abnormal blood vessels that grow. And way back then, if you were lucky enough to have a teeny little blood vessel growing, so maybe a single dandelion stalk growing as opposed to a big patch of crabgrass, if you were lucky to have a single dandelion stalk growing, and you were lucky enough that it was a small area, and furthermore, you were lucky enough that it was away from the center part of the vision, then laser is a very effective treatment. It does lead to scar tissue, but again, if you can leave a small scar outside the center part of your vision, it was effective treatment. The problem being that fewer than 5% of people met those criteria. And if you had to leave a big scar from the laser, or if you had to laser right dead center, you were, you were poor off. Uh, in around 2000, 2002, there was a new treatment available called Visudyne treatment or photodynamic therapy. And did, again, I don't want to, you know, if you don't want to raise your hand, don't. But is there anybody in the audience who's had Visudyne therapy over the years? Okay, and that was better than the laser. It involved the intravenous infusion of a drug called Visudyne or vertiporphyrin, and that allowed the blood to circulate to the abnormal blood vessels in the eye. And then the patient sat in front of a very low energy, what you could call even a cold laser, and the light energy from this laser activated the drug in those blood vessels. And although only 10% of people had vision improve with Visudyne, 
a significant number of people, we could at least hold your vision stable or you lost less vision. So even with Visudyne, your vision may still have deteriorated over time, but compared to doing no treatment at all, you ended up with better vision. Number four, we now have good treatments for wet age-related macular degeneration. Not cures, but we have good treatments. And in September 2007, Health Canada approved Lucentis. And in March of 2008, I'm very proud to say that Ontario was one of the first provinces to cover Lucentis treatment for wet age-related macular degeneration if you are over 65. You'll remember a few minutes ago, I talked about the growth factor VEGF as the driver of these abnormal blood vessels growing. And what Lucentis does, we inject no more than a teardrop, um, 50 microliters, which is a teardrop, and it is still, I've been doing these injections for six or seven years, it is still miraculous to me what these drugs do. But Lucentis, or the, the generic term is ranibizumab, blocks VEGF. So while Lucentis is circulating around in the eye, it binds to the VEGF, blocks it. It's an antibody to the VEGF, and it's not allowed to do its dirty work. And again, I always use that analogy. If I talk about these abnormal blood vessels growing like weeds in the garden, Treating with Lucentis is like spraying those weeds. And not everybody, but many patients notice within days of having an injection that their vision improves significantly. But just like weeds growing in the garden, when the weed killer wears off, when the Lucentis wears off, we are right back to square one where we started. And that's the reason that you require repeat treatments on variable schedules that I'm going to get to. So I always say to my patients, if you have heart disease or if you have diabetes, you have to take your medications every day. If you have wet macular degeneration, some patients need injections on a monthly basis. Some people don't need them that often. But this is a treatment, not a cure. I'm very excited that there are some new treatments coming down the pipeline. Um, you heard from Bayer, and there is a new drug that is called ILEA that has been approved in the United States, and I think in Australia, and in many countries, pretty much almost everywhere, but here in Canada, although we're expecting that towards the end of the year. ILEA works similar to Lucentis in that it blocks VEGF, and I won't get into the technicalities. It works in a slightly different way. It also, I'm sorry to say, has to be injected directly into the eyeball. But we are hoping that maybe it doesn't have to be injected as often. Maybe after you've had what we call the loading dose of three injections in a row on a monthly basis, maybe in some people, you might only have to have injections every other month which I think if you are one of those people who has to come to have injections every month, if we can double the interval in between, that's huge. That's huge. Another study that we are about to embark on at Sunnybrook involves another drug that we inject into the eye in combination with Lucentis called Fovista. And we are just about to embark on this study. Fovista, I, I mentioned, let me back up a bit. I mentioned that VEGF is the predominant growth factor that drives these abnormal blood vessels. But it's never as simple as that. There are other growth factors involved. And one of them that we think might influence why you have to have repeated injections, why these blood vessels keep coming back, is something called platelet-derived factor. And Fovista blocks the platelet-derived growth factor. 
And what we think the platelet-derived growth factor is, you have these abnormal blood vessels growing, just like weeds growing in the garden. And when they are fresh and new and naive, it's very easy for the lucentis to attack them. But what happens once these abnormal blood vessels have been there for a while, they start to become surrounded by support cells or support tissue. And once that happens, it makes it more difficult for them to be targeted by the VEGF. The fovista, which blocks the platelet-derived factor, prevents those new blood vessels from becoming surrounded by the support cells and may keep those abnormal blood vessels in a more immature state so that they are more susceptible to the effects of the lucentis. So that's a study that we've just gotten approval and we are looking eventually to get started, hopefully in the next six months. So in the last six years, the progress, not cure, I can't say to my patients, I'm going to give you three injections and your vision's going to come back and everything is great. If you look at all the patients who undergo lucentis treatment, 30 to 40% of them will have some improvement in vision, which is far better than laser and far better than the 10% improvement with Visudyne. But if 30 or 40% improve, that means 60 or 70% don't. But overall, if you look at all the patients who have undergone the anti-VEGF treatment, 90% of patients either will have some improvement or at least we can keep the vision that you've got. So it's only 10% of people who do not respond to these treatments and continue to get worse down the road. Another huge area of research is in what we call drug delivery, sim sis drug delivery systems. I do not enjoy giving patients injections every month. I sweat everyone. Everyone has to be perfect, and nobody's perfect. They are investigating very, very actively more long-term, whether it's a tiny little implantable device or longer acting of these agents. So we can reduce the treatment burden, not only on patients, but on physicians as well. OK, we are down to number three. You will not die if you have to have injections in your eye. You will survive. I will never forget. I, 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 you, you learn to read patient signs. Again, those of you who know me best know that I spend a lot of time getting to know my patients. And I've got a new patient sitting in front, and I've got their photographs, and I've got their scans, and I'm going to tell them what I'm going to do. And you're just watching their reaction when I'm going to tell you I have to give you a needle in your eye every month for the next however long. And um, I have one patient who I know looked at me and she said, that's appalling. And again, I don't know if you want to self-identify, but who in the audience, and some of you can't hide because I see you, but who in the audience has had injections in their eyes? Okay? It's easy for me to stand up here. It's easy for me to say to my patients, and I try not to say it until they've had the first one, it's easy for me to stand up and say, it's not as bad as you're going to think it is. But that's true, isn't it? It's not as bad as you think it's going to be. I think one of the newest things when it comes to talking needles in the eye is we now are trying to individualize the regime or the treatment regimen for each individual patient. You know, do you have wet macular degeneration? Do you have dry? Well, my friend has wet, and she goes down to St. Mike's, and her retina specialist gives her an injection every month. Why well, am I only getting injections every three months? Or my, I get injections every six weeks, and my, you cannot compare yourself to somebody else. The original studies done on Lucentis were monthly injections for two years, which gave dramatic results. And I would guess that 20, 
maybe 25% of my patients do need monthly injections. If I let them go five weeks because they went away or I went away and they come back and I repeat their OCT scan and that fluid is back there and they notice the difference. So I would say about 20 to 25% of my patients do need monthly injections. On the other end, maybe 10 or 15% of my patients, I do one or maybe two or three and it dries up and it never comes back. That doesn't mean I've given up on you because I need to keep following because this is a nasty, sneaky disease and will come back when you least expect it. But in the session earlier, one of my patients from many years ago came up and reintroduced herself to me. She had one injection five or six years ago. And I can't explain why. There are genetic, there are all kinds of variations. In the middle, about 50 to 60% of my patients, we do a protocol, what we call treat and extend. So that as long as possible, I'll give you an injection at four weeks. And if you come back and your scan and everything is stable, I'll give you an injection and we'll see if we can go six weeks. And if everything is good at six weeks, I'll give you an injection and let's see if we can go eight weeks. And I'm watching to see at what interval, when I look at your scan or when I measure your visual acuity, is it just starting to creep back? And that then tells me, okay, maybe in you we can go two months in between your injections. And that's what gives me my gray hair because I have to figure that out in each individual patient. And whoever's sitting in my chair is different than the person who came before and is different from the patient who came after. But I think that's probably the newest, uh, I'm not sure what word, but the newest technique in terms of trying to figure out dosing intervals. Number two. The sooner that wet macular degeneration is diagnosed, the sooner it can be treated and the better the outcome. Okay, if you look in your registration pack, there's a little grid, a little piece of graph paper. And you don't even have to use something like that. I actually stop giving Amsler grids to my patients because it generates a lot of anxiety. But here's what you have to do. On a weekly basis, I'm going to teach you how to do your own eye examinations. And whether you want to use the Amsler grid or whether you want to do something even simpler, such as looking at a door frame or looking at a hydro pole or looking at the vertical blinds on your, on your back door window. The important thing is, with your glasses on, however you see best, the important thing is to test each eye separately because you can go completely blind in one eye and the brain just carries on and you may never notice it. So once a week, I want you to test each eye separately, either using the grid or whatever you want to look at. And you want to make sure that everything is straight, that there is no distortion, and that there is no big blind spot. And you know, you might have to blink your eyes a couple of times, and it may take you a couple of tests to, so that you notice and determine what is then normal for you. You then have a baseline. And if there is any sudden change in your vision, so that when you test yourself one day, if you notice that those lines are crooked and distorted, or if you notice that there's now a big blind spot that wasn't there last week, and, you know, blink your eyes and... Okay, maybe test yourself the next day. But if there is a persistent, drastic change in your vision, you must contact your eye doctor immediately. And sometimes eye doctor's offices aren't as great as my Rachel and Gail. And if you cannot get into your eye doctor, then you must go to the emergency. This is nothing to play around with. You don't hope. It's going to go away because the earlier we catch it, we can limit the scar tissue and a better visual result. The number one top 10 thing that you need to know about age-related macular degeneration is that you will never go completely blind. 
You might have a blind spot in the middle, and you might have to lose your driver's license. But you're going to hear from a wonderful low vision specialist later this afternoon. There is a room full of visual devices out there. And it's frustrating, and it's a change from what you've had. And you're going to be frustrated and ticked off and depressed and anxious. But if you can persevere with the proper help, visual aids, um, Kindles, iPads, there is all kinds of wonderful technology out there. The bigger you can make it, the brighter you can make it, and you will learn to use the vision that you've got left. And I think that's the most important take home message. Uh, Dr. Schwartz, um, is there any connection between uh, the environment and this uh, enormous number of people now suffering uh, with the macular degeneration thing? You know, you raise a very good question. Um, not specifically. Um, you know, we worry about ultraviolet. Pollution, smog in particular, has not been associated with it. But nobody knows. Um, again, I think Dr. Bakshi is going to talk about some oxidative stress and other factors that may be involved. Um, Age-related macular degeneration is definitely a disease of developing, sorry, of developed rich countries. I, you know, unfortunately, people in, in third world countries don't live long enough to develop macular degeneration, so it's almost a disease of progress. So there could be some element in that, but not specifically that we know about. Oh. Um, I am very curious because you mentioned hereditary. Now, my mother was 96 when she died, and as far as I'm concerned, she did have AMD and she was more or less blind. Um, it seemed to travel through the females. Uh, for instance, it, I don't have daughters, but I have sons. Is it likely to go to them? or it the, it, the, the genes are multifactorial that have been identified, and there is more than one gene. So the actual hereditary patterns have not been fully elucidated. Um, it may be part of the reason why it's more common in females, but I don't think it skips gender. It's about 50% of cases that run in families. And I'm asked it all the time, and it's very difficult to know. The main thing is age. And as I said, that huge bunch of us baby boomers who are pushing through, are we going to get it because we're getting older, or are we going to get it because of hereditary? It can be very difficult to tease out. Thank you. <laughs>